course, makes the payers of the health system uh, sleep not very well because uh, the epidemic of the obesity will translate into these complications in just a, and it's just a matter of time. Hmm? But still, preventive measures are a problem uh, to, uh, to obtain in Austria, for example. Yeah? It's not easy to pay for, and it's very limited, actually. Yeah, here just to see in, in numbers, the prevalence of obesity, of type 2 by obesity according to BMI. So we said, so this is are the overweight, and these are the obese. And, yeah? and you see <coughs> uh, the prevalence is largely increasing. So with the BMI over 40, we have a quarter of the patients already having type 2 diabetes. And, um, and so <coughs> OK. Uh, these are old data with one and I'll show you a new, uh, new data later. But the basis of the of type 2 diabetes is the insulin resistance, as we call it. And, um, and also tightly associated is what we call metabolic syndrome. And I will give you a, a definition later. The problem is that with type 2 diabetes and or metabolic syndrome, when the patient has this diagnosis, it, his risk for cardiovascular disease is largely increased, and also with type 2 diabetes, there are the microvascular complications to which, uh, about which I will talk. Okay. <coughs> yeah, insulin sensitivity. Yeah, what does insulin in the in the body? So, in the, for clinicians, it always has to be very clear cut because the the, the patient is a uh, uh, is, is complex enough. So we measure from insulin, or it's the most important action of the insulin is to reduce blood circulating blood glucose concentration. Yeah? So insulin has a lot of ac a lot of actions, but this is the action. This is uh, this uh, blood glucose lowering action is really uh, confined to insulin. There is no other hormone in the body which by itself can lower blood glucose. Yeah? So. <coughs> You can measure this, um, and insulin resistance, let's say, the, uh, the, the other way around uh, uh, definition. Mm -hmm. And so what we, what we do, have a nice, yeah, this is a nice slide. So in, when you really want to know what, how good uh, or how well the insulin really works in the body, then you do a uh, clamp testing. And this is, these are data from clamps, the clamp testing. So these are, let's say, pharmacology in the whole body. Yeah? And what is done is that you uh, inject or infuse a certain amount of insulin. So you start with a bolus and then you give a certain uh, amount continuously of insulin. And with this, um, insulin, you end up in a, in a certain concentration of insulin in the plasma. And at the same time, you infuse, so you have some other stuff you need, but actually, in, in fact, you infuse glucose at a certain rate to uh, keep the blood glucose concentration at a certain level. So let's say 100 milligram per deciliter. And uh, so you inject a low dose of insulin and hold the infusion and you just look now how much glucose do I have to infuse in order to keep uh, the blood glucose concentration constant. Yeah? And this is called uh, uh, a clamp, not experiment, clamp testing. And <coughs> when you go up with the insulin, it's called a hyper uh, euglycemic, so it's a normal glucose level, hyperinsulinemic clamp. And <clears throat> now you see, the more insulin you inject, when you hear the condylin controls, you have a very steep increase in the efficiency of the insulin to, um, uh, to draw the uh, glucose from the plasma into the tissues. It's very steep. And this is what is what's occurring after a meal. Usually you're down here, 
um, <coughs> and after a meal, you have a largely elevated plasma insulin level, and very efficiently the plasma insulin uh, puts the, the glucose out of the out of the plasma into the tissues. When you see here and your bees, <coughs> you need you see here a shift to the right in this curve, and uh, and you see here so the. Uh, the half to, to, to have a half maximal effect, you, have, you need already, let's say, uh, two times or three times the amount of insulin. Yeah? And when the insulin resistance is very severe, you do not end up at the same maximum, actually. Yeah? But it levels off somehow, somewhere here, and then you do not get more, uh, uh, more effect. And that's in, you see this in clinic. So we have, if you imagine, we have a, uh, a very obese patient, and he needs insulin, and he already has, let's say, 200 units a day, which is a lot. So you, as you're sitting here around, you will have 40 units around per day. Yeah? So for this patient, so we already have 200, and it's still the blood glucose is high because uh, he is here in this in this leveling off. And then you can add another 100 units. It doesn't matter so much yeah, because uh, the body will not react more on the insulin. So <clears throat> this is called insulin resistance, this shift to the right. And in this, in this, um, uh, in this experiment, so you, um, or let's say, well, what are the main tissues which react to insulin? You know? What are the main tissues to react to insulin? Muscle? Adipose? Yeah? Liver. Liver. Liver is always a good choice when you talk about metabolism. <laughs> okay, so in this uh, condition, you usually measure pri uh, primarily muscle. Yeah? When you measure it like that. Yeah? Uh, but uh, do, you have, do you have some insulin also uh, during fasting? Yeah? And what's, what's the. Uh, what's the function of insulin while fasting? Any idea? To mobilize the sugar that's produced by the protein from huh? Open it. Because when you're fasting, you rely on your stores, mm -hmm. and that's the food you want. Then. No, but what does the insulin do by fasting? What the sugar needs to be mobilized when it's yeah plasma. yeah but so when you have when, but what do you measure when you what is the the you know you measure fasting blood glucose yeah what what depends uh, but what is the main determinant of the fasting blood, blood glucose have you ever thought about that you always have. Uh, you, you by yourself, I hope you have fasting blood glucose above zero. <coughs> <No? laughs> uh, otherwise you would not. So this is actually the suppressive action of insulin on the gluconeogenesis. So you have a, a variety of many hormones actually which can increase blood glucose. And the predominant is the glucagon, which uh, as you have said, yeah, but there are many uh, hormones that can uh, uh, raise plasma glucose concentrations and um, and the insulin suppresses uh, all the other hormones yeah? and this is so you can make a similar experiment as that in, in, uh, in let's say in, 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 yeah it's, it's not fasting but here you see that very low this is the hepatic glucose production glucose production means gluconeogenesis and liberation of glucose by hepatic glycogen, from hepatic glycogen. So it's combined as uh, glucose production. And you see here at very low insulin concentrations in a lean um, person, insulin very effectively inhibits the hepatic glucose production. And this is very important because uh, when, when you eat something then, so you need a little bit in the fasting state, but when you eat something, uh, this um, hepatic glucose production goes to zero very rapidly. Mm -hmm. 
in the obese, you have need much more insulin to reduce the anti glucose production. Yeah, and this is and this is actually what you measure when you measure uh, blood glucose or insulin in the fasting state. Yeah? So you need a little bit uh, in, in, in a in an obese person. So you need have more insulin in the circulation and a higher uh, fasting blood glucose concentration because of that. And the, the product of these two with a, together with a constant is the so-called, maybe you've heard it, HOMA index. HOMA insulin resistance index is a product of fasting glucose and fasting insulin. Yeah? And actually the insulin is increasing earlier than the glucose. Okay, so this is a reduction of hepatic glucose production. Yeah, and so there are uh, some factors contributing to type 2 diabetes. We have some genetic factors. So type 2 diabetes is typically um, has typically a, a family history. Uh, this is not only due to the genetics, but also since, um, for example, obesity is also is large, uh, heavily depending on the social environment. Yeah? and also a little bit on, on the genetics. And so environmental factors, uh, this includes, of course, the lifestyle, you know, which is a major determinant. So when you end up in insulin resistance, you first, the, pay, the, uh, the body first increases insulin, insulin secretion. You know? And as long as this is the case, the uh, individuals do not have diabetes. Diabetes only occurs when the beta cells um, uh, are when the beta cell function is disrupted. Yeah? When they cannot produce the beta cells in the, in the pancreas cannot produce so much insulin anymore as would be needed to um, yeah, to to suppress uh, glucose production or, or reduce plasma glucose. And even, only then uh, the patient develops type 2 diabetes. So when the type 2 diabetes develops, all this is already passed. Yeah? And this usually takes years until the beta cell finally gives up yeah? and the diabetes. And therefore, it's, we have now a, a number of preventive, prevention studies on diabetes. And you see when you do it here in this population, now yeah, these non-diabetics or pre-diabetics as we call them, so in a just slightly elevated glucose levels, but not yet diabetes, then these are usually effective. It's very difficult to have an effective uh, program, lifestyle program in type 2 diabetes. Yeah? Because the beta cell might recover, but it's difficult. Yeah? This, um, so, uh, after bariatric surgery, for example, it's possible. It's also possible with, with lifestyle. It's very expensive. Okay, so we have here this uh, this association of the body mass index with different diseases. And you see here the steep uh, curve uh, related to type two diabetes, and the others are also significantly related, but not so strongly. Yeah, and here you have a, one of the uh, very uh, famous prevention programs uh, which have shown, uh, shown that lifestyle um, intervention is really effective. This is the American Diabetes Prevention Program. And there were three groups. And you have the placebo group. And uh, these subjects just, uh, they were told, so eat less, do some sports, that's good for you, something like that. And uh, when we have this intensive lifestyle modification, so the individuals get programs, sport group three times a week, um, so every second week telephone call, what about your eating behavior, what did you eat? Can you tell me? So, so it's really it's study. Yeah, it's intensive, but it's very effective. Yeah, you see a nearly sixty percent reduction 
in diabetes. Yeah? It's very okay. And in between with the metformin, this is a drug in, I guess you know, <coughs> the mainstay of type 2 diabetes um, uh, treatment, and this was in the midst of this treatment. Yeah? Okay, but we actually what we do in clinics due to time constraints is actually the placebo. Yeah? Uh, a little bit better, maybe. Yeah? Uh, but it's very, to have an intensive lifestyle program is something which is actually very costly. Yeah, so, but it's not only the BMI that counts, but also where the adipose tissue is located. And this is, in, in clinic, we measure, for example, the waist to hip ratio. This is me, yeah. Waist to hip ratio. And those people who have uh, the, the adipose tissue in the abdomen, in the belly, these are the ones uh, which really have uh, the risk to develop type 2 diabetes. Or, in this case, myocardial infarction when we go in, uh, to metabolic syndrome. Yeah. So this is the picture. Um, so here you have this, this uh, adipose tissue only in the, or mainly in the belly, and here you have it in the subcutaneous uh, region, typically hips and, and thighs. Yeah? Okay, this, many women are concerned about that, but this is metabolically completely inert. So it doesn't anyone do, doesn't do anything. So there are a couple of studies showing with liposuction really removing kilograms of fat, there's no change in metabolism. Yeah? And of course sometimes you have some mixture of these two, but uh, in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the subjects which have typically only subcutaneous fat composition, the metabolism is usually quite normal. This is completely different to this form, so you may there are, there are subjects which preferentially um, store the fat within the abdomen, and these subjects often have metabolic deteriorations, either, or even though they are only overweight. Okay. Yeah. So in, in studies you can do it like that, that you make a CD scan, uh, so in the, in the lumbar range, and here in white, you see all the uh, fat tissue you know, uh, that is called visceral fat tissue, so everything within the abdomen, and in black, you have the subcutaneous tissue. Of course, when you only measure here the, the uh, waist circumference, you have a kind of somehow a mixture of both. Yeah? But for clinical, in clinics, it also has, has to be very easy, straightforward in, in such patients, and this is the measure of choice. Yeah, so you see here, here um, is the percent central abdominal fat, meaning the, uh, how the proportion of, of fat into the, in, the, in the belly, like in the CD scan we have seen before. And here you have this glucose infusion rate, we have seen in the clamp testing. Yeah? So this is a measure of uh, insulin sensitivity and you see as the visceral fat goes up, the insulin sensitivity goes strikingly down. Hmm? And what's very interesting in, in, in this kind of uh, data is that this is already true for the normal weight persons. Yeah? This is BMI below 25. And even there, you see that persons, even they are still normal weight, those who, uh, who um, uh, increase abdominal body weight have a lower um, glucose infusion, as well as lower insulin sensitivity. So these data have really been repeated in many, as a high number of studies. And these are women without diabetes, these are Europeans, so uh, they have other, yeah, these are diabetes, uh, diabetic men from Asian origin. So there's all over the world uh, this data has been collected in similar uh, variations. Okay, yeah, and here you see, so this is typically uh, prospective studies, 
um, this is, um, you see the impact of the BMI, so the body weight, let's say, and uh, the waist to hip ratio on the incidence of type 2 diabetes in the population. And this is, so in, in, this is a population study in Gothenburg, actually, and when you, when you have, and at time zero, you collect the data. So, and then you divide the data, in this case, in three groups of the same numbers. Yeah? And these are called tertiles. Yeah? In, this, in this direction. And then you see here that those with a low waist to hip ratio, meaning those who uh, uh, accumulate the body fat in the subcutaneous area, but not in the belly, they have no increased type 2 diabetes ratio even uh, the type 2 diabetes risk even if they increase body weight. Yeah? But on the other hand, those where the weight waist hip ratio is high, so there should be a three here and here. One, two, three. Yeah? Um, where, where the waist hip ratio is high, they have already increased diabetes risk when they are in the, in the low BMI rate, uh, and in combination with a high BMI, this is detrimental. So there's a 30-fold increase in risk between this group and this group. Yeah? So this is very dramatic. And, um, see. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and these are prospective data, so meaning that uh, there's one type on zero where you measure the the subjects, and then you only wait. Yeah? And after certain amounts of time, you ask the participants to come again to the study center and you measure blood glucose or whatever they did. Yeah? And uh, so, and, and this is after 13 years, and this is very important because now you see that, for example, an elevated waist to hip ratio confers a risk. So you can say this patient. Uh, according to the data I can collect now, I know in the next, let's say, 10 years, this, uh, this individual will uh, most probably uh, develop diabetes. And this is very important in, in, in a clinical sense to identify risk populations, because in these populations, preventive measures are, um, are effective, and others not. If you select this population for preventive measures, you will never be successful. Because there's no increased risk. Yeah, similar for coronary heart disease, but it's not the same. So, in, in order to identify, so uh, let's say, so now from, from a clinical perspective, it's important to identify populations at risk. And in the, in the 70s, where all the studies uh, came up from Goldstein and Brown on the LDL, and the LDL receptor was identified, and all the stuff. We knew, okay, high LDL cholesterol leads to coronary heart disease. And on the other hand, so in the 90s, the data grew that people with type 2 diabetes have a very high coronary risk as well. And in between, there is a population which on the one hand has a risk for type 2 diabetes, and on the other hand, uh, a risk for cardiovascular disease. And this is now the risk population which we would like to, which should be uh, defined. And this risk population is called the metabolic syndrome. Yeah? So, and it's called the risk associated with it, it's called cardiometabolic risk. So, there's a cardio risk and a metabolic risk. Yeah? So, this is what um, where the dyslexic syndrome comes from. And uh, be because it's so, it should be easy, there were lots of uh, associations which developed uh, definitions of the metabolic syndrome. Yeah? Um, and here, after, after uh, uh, yeah, nearly 10 years, they sat together and made this harmonizing criteria. And this is where you, how you define a metabolic risk patient. This is a visceral obesity, just remember the, the waist circumference then uh, blood pressure, 
the serum triglycerides and HDL cholesterol, so these are the lipids, and a fasting blood glucose in this pre-diabetes range. No? And any three, if, if, a, if a subject fulfills three of these five, it's called having a metabolic syndrome in this, then at risk. No? And, and that this risk is really important, is shown here. You see here, again, prospective data. So here at time zero, you uh, divide the patients into a now patient, they're actually individuals, yeah, in those having metabolic syndrome or not. And then after, let's say, 10 to 12 years, you simply, in this, in this study, was only looked on cardiovascular mortality. <coughs> so meaning uh, subjects that have died from a cardiovascular disease. And you see here, it's a 3.5 fold risk. Is this a lot? Or no? Is a question? I'm not sure. Uh, is, is smoking a risk for cardiovascular disease? Could we agree on that? Yeah? Okay. Uh, how much do you guess is smoking? Hmm? Any, any estimates? No? 30, 40. 30, 40, okay. No other estimates. Okay, no, it's, it's not so much. It's around 2.5. Mm. So it's in on a population basis, this is a lot. So you would, if you have a risk, a, a, a risk in your personal life, twofold enhanced, you would really feel that. Yeah, mm. this is a big difference. And these are not all data, so I have to say, it, then in mean they are two to two point five, yeah. So around smoking, yeah. So around this, okay. Good, yeah. Here we have uh, diabetes worldwide numbers in this is 2013. Yes, so it's increasing, and also in 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 uh, Europe, diabetes prevalence is increasing. Yeah, and the problem with obesity is this uh, this excess risk here again uh, now for diabetes patients. So we switch from, from metabolic syndrome to diabetes now, and you see here uh, excess mortality. Yeah, and um, and uh, yeah, here is one. So this would be uh, a normal mortality. These are so-called standardized mortality. mortality rates, that means um, that you have, you calculate the mortality you see back to a population with, um, with a, to a non-diabetic population with the same age and sex, yeah? So this is, and you see here around 2.5, threefold excess mortality for cardiovascular and also for non-cardiovascular mortality, okay? So all cause mortality 3.5 and this is the problem that the diabetes is uh, associated with a very high risk. Okay, how you, uh, do you um, diagnose diabetes? So, um, either the, the uh, fasting glycemia over 126 milligram per deciliter or in the two hour oral glucose tolerance test over 200. And also, oh, this is missing here, in the HBA, you write this down, the HbA1c of over 6.5%. And, uh, and uh, uh, the, there are also, it's also a pre diabetes range, and the pre diabetes range is, let's say, a gray area, which is still. Uh, reversible, but in which the, the, pre, uh, the diabetes risk is very high, and this is here beyond 100 in the fasting glucose, between 140 and 199 in the two-hour glucose tolerance test, and in the HbA1c, maybe you write this down too, uh, it's 5.7 to 6.4 percent. 5.7 to 6.4. Oh, okay. So, 
what kinds of diabetes do we have? So we have type 2 diabetes, this is on autoimmune diabetes, you know that, and uh, leads to disruption of the, uh, of the pan uh, pancreatic islands. And so type 2 1 diabetes is always treated with insulin. Yeah? There's no, uh, no other medication. Okay. And then we have this type 2 diabetes, this is a long list uh, of, of uh, the medications we can use nowadays. Not so important for you now, but what I would like to introduce to you are the Modi diabetes types, yeah? because this is <coughs> this is a mono, these are monogenic forms of diabetes, and this is very interesting from um, pathophysiological point of view. So you learn which genes are important for diabetes. Yeah? <coughs> uh, so this is autosomal dominant uh, disease, most of them, and they, uh, they, they manifest with diabetes typically before the age of 25, and these are, typic and these are lean patients. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. in contrast to type 1 diabetes, in type 1 diabetes you have an absolute um, deficiency of insulin. Yeah? And therefore, type 1 diabetes patients develop um, ketoacidosis. Yeah? Uh, here, these patients do not develop ketoacidosis only very late in their life. It, it could be possible, but they are actually more uh, related in, in their, in their uh, in phonetic point of view to type 2 diabetes. So this is very interesting. And here you see there's a, a long list of MODI types actually, and most important are the type two, MODI two and MODI three, which comprise most of the of the uh, patients. And you see this is HNF one alpha. It should be alpha this side. Yeah. Sorry, uh, make two windows change, um, and. This, and you also see a number of, of transcription factors actually which are important in the beta cell. Yeah? And this is uh, related to what I have said you uh, um, at the beginning, that you only develop type 2 diabetes when the beta cell is disrupted. Yeah? And therefore these, uh, all these mutations except the glucokinase uh, are actually transcription factors that are important in the beta cell, in the human beta cell. Mm -hmm. um, the exception is the glucokinase. The glucokinase actually is the enzyme which traps the uh, glucose in the beta cell. And this is important uh, to, to phosphorylate the glucose in the beta cell in order to be detected. And, um, uh, because this is the, the first step for the beta cell to detect how much glucose is actually around in the plasma. And when there is a, when there is a mutation in the glucokinase, this does not disrupt the beta cell, so the beta cell will be alive until its end, but, um, and, and, but it will just set the threshold higher for, uh, for secreting insulin. And this is a very benign um, mode of, uh, yeah, sort of modi, because this is, does not change over the lifetime. It's always the same. It's just slightly elevated glucose concentrations, and the, the patients have a very good prognosis. Com on the other hand, these others have a, a much worse prognosis, and most of them end up requiring insulin in the end. Okay. Good. Yeah. So the problem with the diabetes again is um, is the the other complications, and we actually uh, we have talked about the macrovascular complications, meaning cardiovascular uh, so cardiovascular disease such as myocardial infarction, stroke, and something like that. And this is this is related to um, to type two diabetes. But the typical uh, complications of diabetes are the microvascular complications. 
and this is a year, and the microvascular complications is, these are the following, the renal insufficiency, um, then you have the diabetic retinopathy, so eye disease, eye background disease, uh, and we have the neuropathy, so the liver and the nerves is a, uh, is a problem, and uh, as a combination we have this what we call a diabetic food syndrome. It's a combination of uh, bad um, um, perfusion and, um, and uh, let's say a numbness at the soles of the feet, which, relate, which leads to, to the uh, fact that uh, there's no sensation when the sole of the foot is somehow penetrated by, let's say, a small stone in the shoe or something like that. And uh, then ulceration occurs, and this really endangers the whole food of the patient. Yeah? And this is a real problem, and takes a lot of resources in order to to get this. Uh, if an ulcer, when an ulcer of occur, in order to get this healed again. <coughs> okay, diabetes is the leading cause of renal failure. So you have more diabetic patients. Uh, in end-stage renal disease, or let's say, currently it's about the same, but end-stage renal disease according to diabetes or to the, to the, let's say, intrinsic renal diseases. Yeah? So it's about half in, in patients with end-stage renal disease. Um, uh, fortunately, due to the very strict treatment that has developed during the last two decades, the renal disease occurrence in diabetic patients is reduced. Then blindness, uh, mean, uh, so blindness due to the retina, the leading cause is uh, diabetes. Of course, if you would not treat uh, uh, the cataracts, the cataracts would be the first. But blindness due to retina, uh, causes this diabetes and non-traumatic complications. This is what I told you about this food syndrome. This is really a okay. Yeah, cures life expectancy and cardiovascular disease. But if you reduce blood sugar, you see that, um, that uh, these complications are significantly reduced, particularly this, um, uh, the microvascular complications. This is in type 2 diabetes. Type 1 diabetes is, is the same or even more because type 1 diabetes is the, let's say, the pure hyperglycemia only disease, whereas the type 2 diabetes, we have also the lipid changes and so on. Yeah, insulin has a lot of actions. Most important and, and is the glucose transport in our uh, and action glycogenesis, so, but also uh, improves. Lipogenesis, so it's important that all the um, all the fatty acids that um, are achieved from the from the gut are stored in the adipose tissue, so inhibits actually lipogenesis. Yeah, and it's also an anabolic hormone leading to uh, protein synthesis and cell division. Yeah? so as you know, uh, insulin is also used. Uh, for doping, for example, yeah? Yeah, to increase muscle mass. Yeah? So the insulin receptor this, is, um, is, a, is a kinase associated there, yeah? and you primarily phosphorate this insulin receptor substrates, the most important are one and two, and then uh, signaling cascades are initiated, which lead on the one hand, or the PIF kinase, to the, this metabolic uh, changes, and on the other hand, or the VAP kinase to gene expression and in combination to cell growth or differentiation. So these are very common uh, signaling cascades, <coughs> but very specific for the insulin is this. Um, this capsible TC10 pathway, this is, which is also needed for the glucose transporter, so typically the glucose 4 transporter, to transfer plate from the vesicles 
where it's installed intracellularly to the plasma membrane. And so this leads then to the, to the influx of glucose by facilitated diffusion. So this you can also see in, in vitro, so if you, um, if you stain for the GLUT4, it's translocated to the plasma membrane, then you give insulin. Yeah. So uh, we have um, we've done a lot of work on this osteoponte molecule because um, there is a lot of data showing that there is a tight link between obesity and inflammation. Uh, and the idea of this of this um, is actually that, uh, as I've told you at the beginning, it's very difficult really to reduce weight in order to prevent complications. But obesity is associated with systemic signs of a chronic low-grade inflammation, and, um, and this inflammatory response predisposes the patients to type 2 diabetes. I will show you data in a minute, and also to cardiovascular disease. And the inflammatory alterations that are linked to obesity and primarily origin in the adipose tissue. There are also some inflammatory changes in liver and very few in muscle, but the, the dominating tissue is the, is the adipose tissue. Yeah, I will show you pictures on that. Uh, so, <clears throat> when you uh, have obesity at the beginning, you even at the beginning you start uh, as we have done with this with insulin resistance, then the beta cell failure and the insulin secretion, and that goes down, you end up in diabetes. And the inflammation actually you see already in insulin resistance, and it significantly contributes to insulin resistance because the mechanisms that are initiated hamper insulin action. You also see inflammatory changes in the, in, in the uh, Langerhans islets, in the pancreas, that lead to disruption of uh, beta cell action and, and, and beta cell lead to beta cell death and in the diabetes. For example, here, this is again clinic data. So, CRP, C reactive protein, is a common measure of, of um, inflammation which is used in clinical routine. And if you look on, if you divide the CRP values in a, in a population, in the women's health study, to now four tiles, you have seen the two tiles before, so four groups of, of uh, the same size. Then you see in the highest CRP quartile, you have a, a nearly five-fold risk to develop type 2 diabetes compared to the lowest one. Yeah. Very strong association, and these are inflammatory changes as they occur in adipose tissue. And you have here uh, typically resident macrophages, but with uh, development of obesity, uh, you, get, you have more activated macrophages, CD8 cells or other T cells actually. So uh, the, the Population of inflammatory cells changes when obesity develops, and you have more, let's say, aggressive inflammatory types of cells. And uh, in ending up, and then obesity is uh, in obesity, you find cell death, and around the, the dying adipocytes, you have uh, very active macrophages, which uh, heavily uh, secrete. Uh, <coughs> and inflammatory cytokines, <coughs> such as yeah, between 18 and many, many others. And now, when you have these, uh, these um, uh, inflammatory adipokines, these already have an impact on, on the other hand, on the one hand, in the, within the adipose tissue, hampering insulin action in the adipose tissue, but they are also <coughs> secreted into the plasma and so and, and this is one of the reasons why this visceral adipose tissue is so important for metabolism because the, the, um, 
the uh, cytokines that are secreted by the invisceral adipose tissue end up in the portal vein, and the, the portal vein brings the cytokines in high concentration directly to the liver. So you have very high cytokine concentrations in the liver. On the other hand, we know that apparently liver uh, adipose tissue, uh, adipocytes, <coughs> have kind of a maximal size. And the maximal size uh, in the visceral adipose tissue is lower than in the subcutaneous adipose tissue. So this is another reason why the visceral adipose, one of the reasons why visceral adipose tissue is more prone to inflammatory changes. So not only uh, are, uh, do the, adipose, the inflammatory cytokines end up in the portal vein, there's also more production of inflammatory cytokines in the visceral adipose tissue. Okay. And um, this is a very interesting study from Leipzig. Um, and they looked um, uh, what uh, parameters can best predict insulin sensitivity in these patients. And in, in biology, you seldom, you rarely find a, a correlation like that. And there are only two factors included in this correlation. So we are in humans, yeah? Uh, this is uh, inflammation. Um, meaning in this, in, in this case the number of macrophages in adipose tissue and the other is the adipokine. This is kind of a marker of adipocyte function, you could say. Yeah? And these two actually make a, a, an R square of 0.98 for insulin uh, sensitivity. Again, this glucose infusion rate. Yeah? So <coughs> this shows you that for the insulin sensitivity, you actually only two determinants that are really important. The one is the fraction of the adipocyte, and the other is the inflammatory, are the inflammatory changes. So, and so there is a very um, tight uh, crosstalk between um, <coughs> the adipocytes and the macrophages, the cytokines and chemokines acting in a paracrine manner, and uh, so um, uh, adipocytes at the first hand actually attracts macrophages, and on the other hand we have <coughs> uh, then the, the cytokines, inflammatory cytokines that inhibit uh, adipocyte function. Yeah. But inflammation is not restricted to um, to uh, due diabetes development, but is also related uh, to, others, uh, to others' purposes. And on the one hand, you, you certainly know that there is a inflammatory, uh, that there are inflammatory changes in the vascular wall. I'm sure you know a lot about that. I just want to <coughs> show you this paper, which is very interesting, because they uh, did um, of um, syngenie transplantation of adipose tissue. Mm -hmm. So when you transplant adipose tissue, uh, there's always some inflammation going on. Maybe partly simply because the perfusion of the transplanted adipose tissue is of course not optimal. Mm -hmm. And <coughs> they transplanted simply adipose tissue, either visceral adipose tissue or subcutaneous adipose tissue uh, in a it's a biopsy <coughs> strain uh, from, from one mouse to the other. And so they ended up in adipose tissue inflammation, not by obesity, just by the transplantation. You know? And uh, they could show here, and, and I, I told you that the visceral adipose tissue, particularly in the, particularly in the mice, is very much prone to inflammation compared to the subcutaneous adipose tissue. So this is visceral adipose tissue, and this is Adipose adipostation, so you have the MCP1 mm. measurement, which is much higher as an inflammatory marker. And on the other hand, you also see much more atherosclerotic changes in this mice. So this, this data uh, indicate that adipose tissue, by whichever mechanism it occurs, 
uh, actually promotes um, atherogen, uh, atherogenesis. Yeah? Okay. Uh, very short, I will show you some slides. That, so, this is an anti inflammatory drug given to diabetes patients, and you end up in a better glycemic control. Yeah? Very interesting. Yeah? This is a simple anti inflammatory drug. And here, for example, is interleukin 1 blockade. Um, uh, this is a receptor, actually, the, in, in type 2 diabetes. The uh, CRP, this inflammatory marker, goes down, but also glucose goes down. And here you have the HbA1c, this goes down as well. And um, yeah, okay, insulin sensitivity also goes down. But you see here for the CRP as a marker for myocardial infarction, similar data as I have shown you with type 2 diabetes with more CRP, and this is still somehow in the normal range. Yeah? It's not an acute inflammation. You have more myocardial infarction uh, here in two, in two different studies. Yeah? Either way, this is stroke. This is myocardial infarction and stroke. Yeah? So this is very interesting. And you see here, this is a very large study from the emerging risk factors collaborators showing that here is uh, CRP as an inflammatory marker actually uh, results in hazard ratios similar to blood pressure or high cholesterol or late HDL cholesterol. Huh? So it's around the same points, hazard ratio. So at the beginning, one slide left, this I wanted to show. The question is what is at the very beginning? So, which changes in the adipocytes actually lead to the attraction of, um, of uh, macrophages? And um, the ER stress response seems very important in this respect. So, elicited through uh, yeah, increased uh, fluxes of lipids and others, uh, you end up in, a, in this so called ER. Uh, stress response, which is also, which is, let's say, a common response to various cell, uh, intracellular stimuli. For example, also un, it's also an, it's called an unfolded protein response. There are a couple of um, uh, uh, stimulants that, uh, or causes that stimulate ER stress. And to this ER stress, uh, there are data showing by genetic means and others uh, that this really leads to the induction of inflammatory uh, genes and the uh, repression of metabolic genes. This is okay. I think. Do no. do we want to proceed now? Well, then we have another we have another um, uh, section. I will not go into this. Just as a last slide, I show you this one. Uh, but even though, let's say, insulin resistance is a very, comp let's say, a very, let's say, um, um, a term that is related to whole body and so a very complex system, a uh, number of studies have shown that you really can relate this to molecular changes. And in this slide, there are just two uh, mentioned. For example, here you have the TNF receptor as one of the typical uh, side of, uh, as TNF being one of the typical cytokines related to insulin resistance, and the TNF receptor was shown, uh, the TNF was shown by its receptor uh, to activate the tunetinal kinase, leading to serum phosphorylation on certain uh, residues in these insulin receptor substrates, and this then inhibits. Uh, the downstream signaling of the uh, of the insulin. So you, <coughs> on the other hand, here you have interleukin six receptor, the JAK-STAT pathway leads to expression of SOX proteins, and these SOX proteins lead to the early degradation of IRS proteins. And this has been shown that there is uh, less IRS proteins in in uh, cells of the diabetic complex. 
to contact with. So you see, you can really, this complex term of insulin resistance, you can break down to molecular changes at the cellular level in the end. So, but if you are happy with that, we could conclude If you have some questions, I'm still here. I will still be here for a couple of minutes. And otherwise, uh, will you have a, a test on this? Okay. Um, yeah, it will not be difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Um, remember that.